Tom Lonergan. I'm with Edge Space Sciences out of Colorado. Um, it's been a while since I've been, done an open presentation. So when I tend to go fast when I get nervous. So if you want to ask questions and slow me down, go back, hey, what was on that slide that you went through in 10 seconds? That kind of thing. Feel free to stop me and slow me down. A um, little bit of background. I am from Colorado. Uh, I was fortunate enough to move there in 2011. Grew up in Texas and got in with a great bunch of guys with Edge of Space Sciences. Um, so we go ahead and we apply for STEM students. Um, most of the time our relationship is with the Colorado Space Grant at the University of Colorado. And that's how we got into these, uh, this Eclipse Millennium Project. So you want to advance me? Okay. So over on August 21st, 2017, we should have a total solar eclipse occurring over North America. Of course, it's going to be occurring everywhere. But um, the path of totality will stretch from Oregon to South Carolina. So this has been identified as an excellent opportunity for the, the project that we've been tagging. Our contact through the Colorado Space Grant has asked us to support him in trying to achieve this project. Next slide, please. So for our project summary, the objective is to capture eclipse, eclipse imagery and data from the edge of space, uh, 60 to 80,000 feet. Um, we're going to utilize this astronomical project, uh, occurrence to kind of uh, generate the uh, promote public engagement. So since it is public engagement, uh, we don't have to fine tune it. Don't have some pointing requirements, and I'll go over that a little bit later. So this. Uh, this effort's being spearheaded by the uh, Montana Space Grant Consortium. They're actually uh, spearheading the effort. They're trying to develop standardized payloads. They're trying to get the word out uh, so that everybody along the path of this uh, total totality can try to take advantage of this situation and try to get some really interesting imagery and get people enthused and involved. So. So far, there's approximately 47 teams in 20 states all across this path of the totality. Um, it's also being sponsored by the NASA Space Grant Consortium. Um, that's what the Colorado Space Grant is part of, and it tends to go through the local universities in each state. So I can provide some websites a little bit later um, that will get local contacts, so you can look, uh, contact your local Space Grant Consortium and try to get involved with it and support however you can. So our primary is the Colorado Space Grant Consortium. So I've given you their blurb off their website, but basically um, we interact with them a lot. Uh, they run classes uh, where we fly student payloads, and it's getting kids to the, their first exposure to flying uh, aerospace-type payloads where you have a strict weight budget, power budget, everything like that. Take them up to the edge of space and put them in an extreme environment and really put them through their paces. Next slide, Steve. Okay, so EOSS has gotten involved in this, this, as I mentioned, supporting the Colorado Space Grant Consortium. Um, since the path of the total solar eclipse passes through Wyoming, Casper is approximately right about here, where I-25 turns north. And the path will take us over through Guernsey, Wyoming, and pass out into, into Nebraska. This swath is about 70 miles wide, that orange center line that is in there is the path of maximum duration. Uh, so uh, you'll get about, at that point, you'll get about two and a half minutes. I think it increases, but overall <coughs> over North America, I think plus or minus about 30 seconds in terms of duration. So as I mentioned, uh, it goes past Guernsey, Wyoming here. Um, there's a <coughs> reservoir right here on I-25. And next slide. So that plays into our mock site selection. Um, there, when we were first approached about this, uh, a lot of our members, Russ, KB, KB0, TBJ, uh, Nick, he's actually, they've come up with a place um, near Guernsey, Wyoming. It's actually uh, an Army training center. and. It's logistically desirable for us because it's about a three-hour drive. It's about on the stretch. 
it doesn't put pressure on the launch team to have to transport the gas on, on long distances. So the climatology predictions of this area show an easterly path across the, the totality. And I'll show you a, a flight path of the prediction to, based on the, the historical winds. John? Yes. What's the time of day that this is expected for that location? Uh, I think it's approximately 11.20 a.m. Um, mountain time. Mountain time. Standard time. It, okay. Whatever it is in August. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and this is unusual for us. Um, one of the things that plays into it, I'll go over the challenges a little bit later. Um, but we normally launch early in the morning to avoid the, the winds that come up as the day goes by. And that's a challenge in Wyoming. Anybody who's ever been there. So Camp Guernsey is a, a really great place. Um, it's, I'll go over the slide later, it's about 78,000 acres. And so in March 2016, uh, Chris Kaler, our NASA our Space Grant Consortium, the Colorado Space Grant Consortium, point of contact, um, he opened up a dialogue with the staff of Camp Guernsey. And on that day, uh, Nick, Russ, Jim Langstead, and myself accompanied Chris up to try to, try to take a look at it. Um, Nick had actually identified a, a tactical airstrip that would be a good, good location. Um, but we went up there and we conferred with the Guernsey staff, and with their insight, we gained a couple other spots. So generally here, trying to spice it up a little bit. I tend to be kind of dry with my presentations, uh, but we've got a panorama. I think that's you, Nick. It kind of came out a little bit. <laughs> this, is, this is the tag strip right here. Yeah, my, my panorama skills are still good. <laughs> But you see, it, it was actually a, a fairly nice day for March in, in Wyoming. Um, winds were only about 16 miles per hour at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so just a little bit about Camp Guernsey. Joint training facility operated by the Wyoming National Guard. So we get there, we got people in, they're in camo. I'm not that familiar with the Air Force, I was Navy. But, uh, <laughs> so we had Army, Navy, Wyoming National Guard, who do you work for, exchanging cards, that kind of thing. So it was kind of a getting to know those guys and trying to establish with them that uh, we were professionals, we'd like to use their facility. Normally they, they, they're uh, selling their services as uh, drop zone, logistics training, uh, they actually do field artillery exercises. I'm not sure how much is live fire. Uh, but they actually, identified when we conferred with them, we went over the maps of the, of the area, and they identified a couple of probable places, one of them being the truck, the tax truck that Nick had identified, and the other one being a, a drop zone moss. So that's in their northern training area, which is, as you can see, was 78,000 acres, quite an area. Uh, we visited both of those sites, uh, DC moss, <coughs> is a likely candidate. Uh, it's a wide open kind of a pasture field. One of the desirable characteristics of that was that um, with a southern exposure, we had a little bit of a repeater coverage locally, and we were actually picking up, I think, maybe a Verizon um, cell phone signal, which is one of the things that's desirable for our ground station so that we can maintain contact. Now, like I said, we, we interacted with a the joint training facility, so they were unfamiliar with the balloon operations. And, you know, anytime you end up with some of the military guys, they want to make sure that they're covering themselves and that we're not some crazy people coming in and doing everything at <laughs> their site. So, um, first thing they ask is, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? How do we know what you're doing? What are you doing on my site? All those kinds of things. So, uh, after we kicked off our initial, they said, well, we want to know are you insured? And for that, we're deferring to the Colorado Space Program. Um, one of the other things they wanted to say is, you know, what does the FAA think about you flying out of our restricted airspace? They have restricted airspace, I think it's B and C, up to about 30,000 feet on the northern, northern areas so they can do their drop zone operations. Um, and the restriction is actually such that you have to coordinate with Camp Guernsey and ATC. So they said, Okay, we know nothing about balloons, so they kicked it up to their FAA DOD representative. 
And for that, the NASA Space Grant Consortium said, hey, you got, can you guys explain this a little bit better to them? So through a series of emails, we reassured them that we're going to fly these exempt. Um, we know what we're doing. And basically, uh, there are emails I got saying, well, how big is it? What are you flying? How many packages? And I carefully couched all my answers to the, the FAA representative and Renton for the DOD, uh, such that to assure him that this entire thing will be designed to fly exempt. That's our what we're trying to achieve. So in June 2016, the FAA recommended approval of the OSS operations. Uh, they said, even though you're flying exempt, we'd still like you to notify Denver ATC of your operations. We said, yes, definitely we can do that. We're accustomed to doing that. Next slide, Steve. How am I doing on time? You're good. Okay. So flight path for Casher. So like I mentioned, uh, and I'll kind of go over this a little bit later too as well. Um, when we first were approached by this, as is usual, we put our heads together and we started sweating this intense solution as to how we were going to get right across the path of totality. Uh, however, talking to our customer, it's really about public engagement, capturing that imagination, and making sure that we get up there. And if we get good imagery, that's a bonus, but we're going to see what we can get, and, and that's all kind of secondary. So we weren't trying too hard. However, this is not a good slide, I guess, for um, public consumption. So basically, this our usual back and forth when we come through the upper level winds, this is about, I think, above 80,000 feet right there where we turn around. So that corresponds to roughly about this area right here. So we think we're pretty good in terms of the climatological, climatological predictions, but we're really concerned to make sure that you know these things are good in the past, but it usually as we approach, then we get refined things. So we kind of started going over, well, do we need to be flexible on our launch path? This is actually off that tax group. And one of the things that they said, well, you know, as long as you're above 60,000 feet, we're hoping to get a stable stable camper platform that's not moving too much. And we just want to capture any, any imagery we can. So fine-tuning this, this by moving the launch site was not really desirable. Uh, the customer said, let's pick a launch site, let's get everybody there, let's not impact ourselves with the logistics, and let's go and, and let's get everybody enthused about this. So this eclipse path, also you see this is I-25 running up and down through Wyoming. I-25 runs generally to the north, going into the southern Wyoming, and then takes a turn to the, the west and goes to Casper and then moves north. Uh, Camp Guernsey is right off of here, and they're an excellent base of operations. Um, if we get to the point where our flight path is moving as well out of the totality, then we may consider alternate sites and, and do that. Okay, so next slide, please, Steve. So for our EOS support, customers come to us and ask us to support three flights, and these kind of correspond with the overall um, scheme that Montana State has come up with. Uh, they want to have a, a practice flight from the location, prefer preferably. Uh, some of those will be occurring this summer. Uh, we're going to do ours on August 21st, to at least get the uh, August winds scoped in there. And then the payloads are still under development, so we'll be flying with, with payloads of a similar weight or whatever that the uh, Colorado Space Grant Consortium has ready. Uh, May 21st, uh, we expect the full-up sensor packages and the full-up payloads. So this is more of a dress rehearsal with the full sensor package, making sure that their sensor packages are good to fly up up to 100,000 feet. And hopefully that gets us ready for proceeding into the August 21st event, uh, the, is the eclipse capture. Will you do the dress rehearsal up there? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, basically all three will occur from, from Guernsey. Uh, so as I'm emphasizing with this, and I'm emphasizing with the FAA, uh, this will be designed to be exempt flights to, to meet all requirements for uh, 14 CFR Part 101. So that means, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with those. Um, 
So we are actually flying two balloons. Um, the standard image ca capture packages are going to be done through a balloon wave workshop. And then the second balloon will allow a little bit more flexibility. They may put different sensor packages on that developed by the University of Colorado. So EOSS for this will provide our typical launch tracking and recovery services. Next slide. So some of our challenges that we're running into. The area is somewhat remote and beyond the normal EOSS on sites. If any of you have ever been to Wyoming, there are some places that you get out there. Um, that area of Wyoming does have missile silos and things like that. And that's why they put them out there, because it's nice and remote. And I have to, to give KB0TVJ credit for this. The, he told me the WY stands for windy. So, uh, frequent high ground sites, like I mentioned that day, it was about uh, 16 mile per hour sustain and 18 to 20 gusting, which is not bad for Wyoming in March. All day. That's all. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to include a picture. I've got a picture coming back from vacation in Wyoming, headed south on I-70, but it's not a great picture, and it tells you the story. My wife took a picture out the windshield, and it was like 70 mile per hour crosswinds on I-25. And after, yeah, after a couple hours of that, my shoulders were kind of locked up. I felt like I was just kind of vectoring into the wind going down I-25. Uh, so that corner of Wyoming has kind of poor repeater coverage. And especially there's a, like a, uh, I don't remember the elevation, but there, there's a, about a thousand foot ridge to the east of the flight uh, of the uh, launch site, and that kind of cuts off our line of sight. Typically, we like to have the ground station in contact with us. They did a lot of work on the, on the predictions and refining those. Um, we may take advantage of some support that's been offered from the Rocky Mountain Ham organizations to give us some DMR and uh, mobile repeater coverage. Also, that area has, has poor cell phone coverage for the ground station. What we picked up at DZ Moss was a pretty good signal. We're going to see if we can establish a hotspot out there and at least get them in contact with it. Because the uh, the concept that's been put out by the Space Grant Consortium is that they would have iridium linkage and other things like that. And those require the, the cell phone coverage. Go ahead and advance, Steve. So the timeline, like I mentioned, and hopefully I'm like not being too redundant. Uh, the primary is public and student engagement. We've been emphasized that over and over. And, and that's really the thing, is to get them out there, get them to have fun. It's not as science critical as you might think. Uh, so initially we sweated over the flight path and until we knew that, that it was a little bit more relaxed. We were thinking about multiple launch sites, five, six launch sites, make a determination the night before. Um, but with this, logistically, that kind of made us back off and relax about it a little bit, down select one or two launch sites, and, and then only shift if we absolutely have to. So, like I said, the customer clarified that this was not required. Uh, we are trying to get imagery. We'd love to get live downlink, um, but it's all about getting people excited about the solar eclipse. Uh, another one of the challenges we run into is that uh, this is very popular. It's a remote location. There's probably two decent hotels within 50 to 60 miles. A lot of people are coming in. Most of the RV campsites are already, uh, already reserved. Uh, so we don't have to achieve the precise pointing. So we're not worried about that. We have had uh, people that put stabilization <coughs> platforms on our balloons before which they forget that the angular momentum has to go somewhere, so it goes into our flight stream. Uh, so we're, we're relaxed about that a little bit. And we're going to pick a launch site, and we're going we're to go with that. So we've got DZ Moss there. Um, we're going to bracket the maximum totality. Hopefully we get above 60,000 feet, get a little bit of column winds, and then uh, try to take as much imagery as we can. So we're going to launch at approximately 10.45 in the morning. 
So preparation. So we're leaving it up to Colorado Space Ramp to develop the imaging and sensor payloads. Uh, Chris Kibler attended a balloon workshop at the University of Montana la last month. Uh, they went over the sensor packages. They got, got everybody building their packages. And I think they gave everybody a lot of pointers for any places that are from, unfamiliar with the high altitude balloon flights. So the logistics, after they approved us with the a FAA, we haven't had a lot of contact so far. So we've got to go back to them and confirm some other issues. Uh, they do have some building on site, but they may have conflicts and we may be a low priority. Um, we're hoping that the, that large open pasture, uh, they can provide us with sanitary facilities on site and we can do a camp out the night before, just hang out there, get up in the morning and be ready to go. And access for interested personnel. We've had uh, local relationships with the, uh, the local TV stations that expressed interest in covering this event. Uh, like I said, there's going to be a lot of people in the area, so there may be people that want to come and, and try to promote that public engagement. Next slide. So just in general, the payloads. Um, Chris went to the workshop last month. Uh, he was able to give me some insight into this. And we have not had a, a, an EUSS meeting to try to coordinate that with our normal packages. We were planning on flying our own cut-down system just because we were familiar with that and we've got high reliability on that. So this is some of the things that the uh, University of Montana has come up with. So they want to fly an iridium tracking system, uh, position data every 30 seconds for the entire flight. So this is supposed to be able to provide us with our connection through an XB to the cut-down command. Uh, the cut-down system sounds like a mechanical cutting wheel, uh, independent power source, and a four-hour cut-down command. I don't know if they've ever flown this. I don't know the flight heritage. So that'll be a discussion that we'll have with our customer. So the video payload, based on Raspberry Pi, it's got its own power and a 5 hertz, gigahertz downlink. So hopefully we'll be able to get some good video live if possible. Uh, still payload, they're going to transmit and uh, 900 megahertz to try to get still images with one requested from the ground. I don't know if they have uh, time on that as well. Next slide. So this is what's been provided. Go ahead, John, did you have a question? Um, any thoughts of putting a crossband repeater to help with communications? Uh, we haven't discussed that yet. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about our, our weight. Because although he gave me his, uh, his payload packages, he didn't really scope the weight yet. Um, and being an exempt flight, we're going to have to be really strict about the budget with these guys. What kind of weight budget are you, are you giving them? Um, I pretty much told them about eight pounds. Generally, our EOSS payloads run to uh, about three and a half to four pounds. We can get those down a little bit and we, we may give them weight, but I like to give people a weight budget. Uh, I always think that based on aerospace values, and, uh, you give people a 20% weight growth margin. So if I give them eight pounds, and we may type, tighten that down to, to seven and a half, just so that when they're adding an extra 30, 40 grams of electrical tape onto their payload at the last minute, <laughs> that we, we scope for that. So EOSS already has a cut-down system, so yeah. why, are you, why are you... Well, like I said, the, uh, the University of Montana has put, put out their own oh, console. Oh, Montana. This is, yeah, this is uh, coming out of the workshop that Chris went to last week. This is the standard payload that they're trying to generate uh, for all those that are unfamiliar with these operations and to get people going and interested in the high-altitude balloon. So they're trying to provide them with a, just a standard package and say, Here, here's what you want to put together. Um, and it may be one of those things that they were trying to save a little bit of weight on the cut-down system if people didn't already have those. Uh, one of the other things that they're also trying to do is provide a little bit of a challenge to the students so that they have to have some things to overcome. What's an XP? XP? Ah, uh, The 915 uh, uh, tracker uses the uh, Zigbee format. Uh, if they're using the XP Pro, which is a 915 megahertz uh, Zigbee, uh, the XP Pro is 100 milliwatts, and I've gotten 20 miles or so 
on a balloon flight with one of those. However, XB just came out, uh, Digi, the company Digi, just came out with the new XB that's a one watt, 915 megahertz radio. And uh, that'll get you 150 mile range or more. And it's a two way comp. comp. Uh, I was able to send commands with the XB Pro. Uh, Digi makes a 9 extend, which is a 915 one watt a radio, and I've gotten about 180 miles two way comms with that. So uh, it's a license free, uh, 9600 baud, they can do 115.2 baud, K baud, uh, but your range goes down when you go to the higher um, baud range. But you can send video down, uh, still frame pictures at the higher baud rate pretty quickly. But uh, a lot of people use it that aren't ham radio operators because it's license free and it's a way of, uh, it's a primary tracker for many people. Thank so, you. So USS uses the Zigbee protocol to move data up and down the flight stream. And I think that's what they're talking about doing right. here is right. just having, having just basically a, a mesh up and down the It's kind of a local area network. Yeah, just a, yeah. a LAN, low speed, low speed LAN that boards are 20 bucks a piece. They've got some RAM space on them. This is pretty cool stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Ben, are you planning to have uh, receivers for the video in the Chase vehicles? So the 5.8 gigahertz is going to be No, for, for the tracking vehicles, this would be for the ground station. And it wouldn't be for the tracking vehicles. Uh, one of the things I have made allowances for is if you go online, there's really nice, cheap, like uh, 50 cents a piece Eclipse viewing glasses, because a lot of us doing this are going to want to pull over and take a look at it. <laughs> so, yeah, get online and get your little cheapy Eclipse viewing glasses first before everybody gets them. Yeah. So, I'm just curious about the range they expect to get. So, well, we haven't had a full discussion with the, yeah. the customer on this. Year. So, so the, these ubiquity. 5.8 gig units. That's just a basic Wi-Fi, you know, a basic Wi-Fi uh, device that they're looking at. And the Ubiquiti guys make them in, in a bridge, a bridge configuration and an access point. And they've got some pretty high power stuff. But I can imagine if we're going to get this on the ground, we're going to have some serious antenna work to do when the when the dust all settles here, and then then we're going to have the, uh, the beam width challenge that goes with that. So it'll be fun. I would, uh, have they done a test flight yet of the ubiquity because that at 5.8 gigahertz, that's about a one watt transmitter, the link margin is going to be really, really tough unless you have a big ground station antenna. Yeah. Uh, so I, um, we're, <clears throat> we're launching two balloons in Kentucky with Alabama's space ground. And we're, uh, <clears throat> we're going to fly one of these packages and then we're going to fly a digital TV package. Excuse me for a moment. Well, Steve, while he's talking, can you advance the next slide? Give people a chance okay, to yeah. uh, <clears throat> so We're, we're going to launch the workshop payload, uh, and then we're also doing a second balloon. We're launching from Bowling Green, Kentucky, which is at the peak of the Eclipse, actually. Uh, and there's planning on like 50 payloads in Kentucky alone. Uh, Kentucky Space Ranch. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I think they're doing 10, 10 balloons with all kinds of different payloads. All from Kentucky. So you just don't even know which one you're looking at. I know. <laughs> but we are planning a, a 434 megahertz downlink uh, with digital television, uh, which will have a better link marks on the 5.8 gigahertz. Uh, we also have an Iridium, one of my Iridium payloads on that flight, and they have a, a, the same module on their uh, CAN thing. It's not my board, but it's uh, on the same version. But my biggest concern is the video downlink uh, from a moving balloon. Uh, it seems to me like it's going to require a pretty good uh, antenna on the ground to get live video. But they plan to link this all into a streaming video. All the balloons are somehow going to link to a streaming video site that they're completely putting together. So it'd be a fun activity. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that's good information, too, because that, uh, we probably need to think about what the priority is for the practice flight in August in terms of early improve out on the systems and things like that. 
So this has been provided for um, by Chris Kaler to me is something coming out of the workshop and just changing the overall concept of this. And so I apologize, you may be more familiar with this, but this is basically the, the concept that the Iridium is going to provide, you know, you're getting your position, it's probably providing uh, a feedback through the web um, that hotspot's going to be a challenge and we might need to make sure that we iron out some links on that too as well. Because that means it means it's more critical for us to have that link. I think we're going to have to fly, fly our proven EOSS systems just to make sure that we've got something that's got good position on it. Okay, so let's move on. So ground support, our typical ground station that we have coordinates with the tracking team and that's what we're going to do for this mission. Our ground station reviews the tracking information, provides predicted versus actual, and gives, us a, gives it to the tracking team in real time. That's why it's critical it's usually for us to have that link between the ground station and Alpha. <coughs> uh, typically, we've got three person running track point, the eye gates, and juggling everything for us back at the ground station. Uh, Colorado Space Grant will provide the additional systems I've noted here. Uh, we need to connect to the internet. Uh, they've got a, a rocket dish. I'm not familiar with that one, but we'll see what they've got for that. Uh, cut, cut down may be issued from this system. Like we've discussed, we'd probably go with our own cut down just as, and we'll put that in our weight mark margin. And are you testing all that uh, this August during your test, or how thorough is your? I don't think we're going to be planning on uh, testing the cut down. Well, I mean, but, all but yeah. So I think they're still constructing the sensor packages. Like I was saying, uh, based on the input that we get, we may want to prioritize certain things and say these are going to be the most problematic. Mm -hmm. This is maybe what we have to overcome. We haven't had a chance to really sit down and confer with the customer yet as to what his priorities are. So it also seems like, you know, EOSS is going to be responsible for a bunch of station keeping and, and infrastructure stuff. So we'll spend a bunch of energy focusing on how we're going to get, you know, broadband out to this dirt lot, basically, and figure out what what some of that's going to look like. We got to deal with the, you know, we got to manage our power. We got to yeah. deal with the. Uh, uh, with the repeater coverage for the ground ops and all that kind of stuff. So we'll be working a lot of that and a bunch of those things August. You know, we're, we're pretty confident we can get, you know, 12 pounds of stuff into the air. So it's really about the infrastructure stuff for us to start with. Okay, so one uh, Typical balloon operations emphasizing that we're designing these to meet the requirements to fly exempt. Strict weight budget, which is not something that universities are always accustomed to. Uh, we're going to do our customary notifications for Denver ATC, even though it's a non-exempt flight. We're going to provide the launch services. Um, we initially thought that maybe Guernsey would be hesitant on the helium versus hydrogen, um, but it seemed to be a non-issue for them, so I wasn't going to bring it up if you need flight. We may still do, depending on how the customer Customer's going to pay for the gas, so depending on how he wants to do it, um, our launch team will have to, to iron out the support details on getting the gas. Uh, so typical amateur in, I apologize. So 9:10. So we're getting. I don't want to intrude on anybody else's time, but just real quick, our typical amateur radio. Uh, I apologize if some of these things are redundant. I was kind of pitching this to, to Guernsey, so it's probably just unfamiliar. So. You guys are all familiar with tracking by radio. Go ahead. So launch team, transport the gas, fill in the balloon, FAA coordination verifies the beacon off. Well, I'm sorry. So our ground station, typically the ground station, we want to make sure that we're getting out to the internet because when we fly non-exempt, non -exempt, um, we want to make sure that Denver Center can see that and that's what we typically do. Uh, it's not so important as this time, but we pro will provide the notifications. Um, Ground station is going to monitor the balloon track, keep the tracking team on, and inform them if we've got deviations so that we can collect those payloads. Next slide. So, further information. I'm hoping that I can give this to Michael and we can provide it if anybody's uh, interested in further information. This website gives you a really good overview of the entire system. It provides you with these uh, contacting the local space grant office. And then they've got, they've got it split out in order to, to capture the public imagination for someone that might not be 
necessarily uh, technically inclined. You know, they've got uh, broken down into payload teams, launch sites teams, coordination, atmospheric science, and then solar science or art teams. So I think that's uh, my last slide on the. On the so um, I did realize that I neglected to provide my contact information. Um, it's uh, Lawn Dragon, L A W N D R A G O N, like a dragon on your lawn, at gmail.com. So I've uh, got a few minutes for anybody any questions. Otherwise, uh, feel free to approach and we can discuss it on the side. Tell us a bit about EOSS real quick. Okay, so um, this is my first GPSL. I've been with them for about uh, almost four years now. So edge space sciences, our mandate is to provide uh, STEM education through high altitude landing and amateur radio. So we have a typical, um, we have a, a, an FAA waiver. Our quite recently, uh, they've restricted our FAA waiver so that we can't fly through clouds, which is providing a challenge to us. But typically, we work with, um, you have internet access, can you bring up our website? Um, but typically, we work with, uh, we've got a relationship with Colorado Space Grant Consortium. Uh, we typically fly two to three flights per year for them. Those will be double balloon launches, and we've recently stepped up to a yearly three for which is a real challenge for us. Um, they'll, they fly non-exempt, I'm sorry, they fly exempt, um, so and those will be typically 28 to 30 pounds of payload streams. Um, we've taken on additional customers. We've flown flights for uh, the STEM middle or for middle schools, STEM Academy, and Metro State University recently. So did I kind of capture EOSS good or? So it's a I enjoy with it, working with these guys. It's a great organization. And I'm glad to be here. So this flight got pretty challenging for us. Uh, you, you can show them one of the other ones. I don't know if I've got the Eclipse practice flight, but typically we put out, um, I'm a flight coordinator for EOSS, so is uh, Jim Langstead. Uh, Nick's handling flight coordination for our flight today, or this weekend. And typically what we do is um, we'll develop the payload plans, we'll work with the customers, uh, interact with them. Recently I've been trying to develop them to get them into the, the mode that uh, if we wanted to sell to like a, an exempt flight to a customer, that we provide them with nine kilograms of their weight, give them a weight budget, uh, usually 10 and 8.50, that way if they're if they're fat, they work good. So they've been pretty good about managing all that stuff. So we'll go ahead and um, try to think if there's any more information I can give you about EOSS. Feel free to talk to any of us. We can talk to your own. <laughs> so let me just say a, a bit about EOSS. We started flying in the late 80s. Tomorrow's going to be 220. I'm sorry. We started flying in the late 80s. Tomorrow's going to be 225. Uh, we generally, as Tom pointed out, our baseline folks are University of Colorado. It's actually a gateway course that is a required course for some of the freshmen. As a freshman, you have to take a practicum course. In, if you're in physical sciences, some of them choose to take this course. Uh, we fly usually eight payloads for them. So. But the rest of the year, we probably average 10 to 12 flights a year. Generally, we fly out of the front range. We have this small perturbation that screws up our flights greatly. It's called DIA. <laughs> we can't come within 30 nautical miles of the center of the airport. That moves us far out. We also coordinate with them because we used to have a waiver. We actually have a website that creates, uh, that the FAA can go to, that we provide magnetic bearing and nautical mile range to the balloon for two VORs that they can choose on the fly. Uh, 
pre-call an hour out, launch, you get the whole picture. <laughs> your top say we run a ground station, then it gets very quiet because everybody leaves and goes and chases the balloons. Our alpha is Marty chase, uh, running the trackers. We usually have somewhere between eight and 20 trackers downrange. Uh, we pull them all back except one. We're still worrying that one. So it's, it's, a, it's a fairly close-knit group. You see most of us here, over most of the GPSLs. Any other questions? Let's do it all quiet. Okay. Thank you, everyone.